Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Central Presbyterian Church. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am ruling elder Zach Cosner. Uh, we, uh, the link to the uh, bulletin is on our Facebook page, page um, and on our, um, on our website, www.centralprespb.com. Uh, for those of you that have the bulletin, um, i like you for you to turn your attention to the announcements on the back of the bulletin. Um, again, the, uh, due to the lockdown, the uh, style show at Trinity Village has been postponed. Uh, Trinity Village will notify us when it will be rescheduled. Um, you can also follow us on social media for further updates on future uh, worship services. Uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just look for the username Central Prez PB. Um, let us now prepare to worship God. <clears throat> we come in this service to God and bring us the need of the world. We come to God who comes to us in Jesus and who walks with us the road of our world suffering. We come with our faith and with our doubts. We come with our hopes and our fears. We come as we are because it is God who invites us to come and God has promised never to turn us away. Let us worship God. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. Let us ask God to forgive us first in unison and with using the prayer in the bulletin and then silently god our comforter and guide we confess what comes between us and you we have been blind to the faults in ourselves that we may so readily detect in others prizing appearance and credentials and failing to see the heart rushing headlong into temptation without thought for what is right keeping secret what would shame us if it were known, denying truths voiced by people we disdain. God of light, expose our sin that we may confess it and turn from it and so live in the light of your forgiveness and love. And now silently. Amen. As people born of water and the spirit, we have died to the old life and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the ninth chapter of the gospel according to John, beginning with the first verse and proceeding through verse 41. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. As he walked along, he saw a man born or blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. 
Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes. Then I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been born blind and had received sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? Or, I'm sorry, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked him, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is now that he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins and you are trying to teach us. And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is read and proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear. 
that hearing we might believe and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. Probably one of the most tragic scenes in all of American literature is related by Harper Lee in her novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. I'm speaking, of course, of the trial of Tom Robinson, a black man who was accused of raping a white girl. But during the course of the trial, the evidence shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that Tom could not have committed the crime of which he has been accused, mainly because his left arm was left mangled and useless after a childhood accident, and because the girl's bruises on her face were restricted to her right side, meaning that her assailant would have had to have lead, led with his left hand. And then during the course of the trial, it is revealed that the girl's own father is left-handed. Tom is clearly innocent, and yet he is convicted by a jury who refused to see the truth. They saw only a black man and could not get beyond that. Atticus Finch, Robinson's lawyer, tells him not to worry that he had a very good chance of having his conviction overturned on appeal, but Tom, unable to see beyond his own despair, tries to escape and is killed in the attempt. I thought of that passage or that story from Harper Lee's novel as I read this passage from John that we heard this morning. Because regardless of the truth that is placed in front of them time and time and time again, the people refuse to see. We have all heard the cliche that seeing is believing, believing, but that doesn't really hold true in this text. Clearly the people can see that something marvelous and miraculous has happened in the life of a man who had been blind from birth. But seeing that truth hardly brings about any belief. We might even go so far to say that they are blinded by sight, or at least by what they wanted to see. But if we allow ourselves to be touched by this text, we may just discover that though seeing may not be believing, believing is certainly seeing. And that seeing begins with Jesus' healing of this blind man. Now, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, in John's gospel, whenever someone is in the dark, it means they do not know. And the disciples themselves are in the dark, at least when it comes to this man's plight. They are more concerned about who is responsible for this man's blindness than about alleviating his suffering. They, like so many of us, looked for rationales and explanations for the hardships that befall humanity. They wanted to make sense of it all. They looked at this blind man and saw a moment to seek clarity. Namely, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, at least from their perspective, was the perfect opportunity to hear Jesus' take on the matter of sin and retribution because the Hebrew scriptures give us conflicting views. The book of Exodus recorded that God is a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of their parents, 
to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject God, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love God and keep God's commandments. The prophet Ezekiel, however, offered up a different word from God. The person who sins shall die. A child shall not suffer for the iniquity of a parent, nor a parent suffer for the iniquity of a child. The righteousness of the righteous shall be his own, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be his own. And then the prophet Jeremiah added, In those days they shall no longer say the parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge, but all shall die for their own sins. The teeth of everyone who eats sour grapes shall be set on edge. So the disciples wanted to know who had it right. Or to put it another way, who got it wrong? Now, unfortunately, our English translations of Jesus' words have not always been very helpful. Neither this man nor his parents sinned is accurate enough. But what follows is where problems in translation begin. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him as how the rest of verse 3 reads. That tends to imply that God either allowed or caused this man to be born blind just so that God could later be glorified when Jesus came along to heal him. As if this man were put on earth for no other reason whatsoever. But the actual Greek says something completely different. First, in the Greek, Jesus never says in verse 3 that the man was born blind. Those words were actually added by translators so that the grammatical structure of verse 3 would make more sense when it was translated into English. But in the original Greek manuscripts, there were no chapter or verse designations or, for that matter, punctuation. My point, without getting too technical, is that there's a better way to translate this passage, which is to combine all of verse 3 and the first half of verse 4. So a more accurate translation would be something like this. Neither this man nor his parents sinned period. But in order that the works of God might be revealed in him, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. For Jesus, the issue isn't who sinned, but rather this man's condition. All the explanations and rationales in the world would do nothing to help this man and certainly would not glorify God. Only the gift of life, which was the light of all people, would do that. So, when we look at the scripture in that way, Jesus' act of healing this man is not the long-awaited end of some divine plan, but rather it is the beginning. The gift of sight was only the first step toward the gift of insight. And so it is that Jesus says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And just as he had revealed himself to be the living water to a Samaritan woman at the well last week, and thereby offered grace and wholeness, this week we hear Jesus revealing himself to be the light of the world. You can almost hear the words of the prophet Isaiah resonating in the background. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. And elsewhere where we typically hear these words only at Christmas, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. Then to signify just how that light has shined on all who lived in deep darkness, Jesus heals this man 
blind from birth. We're told he mixed dirt with spittle and made mud and spread it on the man's eyes and told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which, as John points out, means scent. Light dawns on his life, and he is sent. The same can be said for each one of us. We experience the grace and love of God, and then we are sent. For what purpose? To proclaim the good news. We are sent to bear witness to the light of the world. We are sent to proclaim the wonders of God and what God has done for us. We are sent by the one who was sent not to condemn the world, but to save the world. It is in being faithful to this calling that we gain greater insight. It is in believing that we truly see. And it is in this man who is healed that we learn that lesson. Because not only did he go and wash, he bore witness to the light everywhere he went. Jesus disappears from the scene. And we're told about how this man encounters first his neighbors and acquaintances. And when they see him, some recognize him as the man who used to sit and beg, while others say, no, it's just someone who looks like him. And they begin to argue about the man's identity. For whatever reason, some just absolutely refused to believe that the great God had brought about something good until this man himself told them that he was the man. Then he tells them about Jesus and how Jesus healed him. The words of the man are the first in four progressive steps toward his really seeing who Jesus is. Still, just as there were those who failed to recognize this man, no one seems to recognize that in healing this man, Jesus was revealing himself to be the light of the world. So they bring him to the Pharisees, and they ask him how he received his sight, and the man told them, but again, they refuse to see the truth because they cannot see beyond their own interpretations of the law. Some of the Pharisees even said, he can't be from God, he doesn't observe the Sabbath. Then others argued, well, if he were a sinner, how could he perform such works? The Pharisees consider only the fact that Jesus didn't observe the Sabbath. And they conclude that he is a sinner. Others consider only the remarkable signs that Jesus is doing and conclude that he must have power from God. But everyone fails to recognize that Jesus is the light of the world. So they begin to argue about who Jesus is. And to try to settle the dispute, they bring in the man's parents. And they ask them, is this really your son? Was he really born blind? They said, ask him. He's of age. Leave us out of it. And the man replies, he is a prophet. The second step toward truly seeing who Jesus is. Again, they refuse to believe the man's testimony, and they even doubt that he had been born blind. And they still just will not accept the truth. His parents wouldn't even see the good news dawning. They understood that the confession of Jesus as Messiah would entail being socially and economically ostracized. And they chose to save their own necks rather than stand by their son. Then we're told the Pharisees question the man again. And they seem to be relying on their knowledge of Scripture and on their expertise in interpreting Scripture and zero in on the fact that they view Jesus as a sinner because he healed on the Sabbath, which was considered work, and 
one should not do that on the Sabbath. But the man refuses to get sucked into the debate. He says, I don't know whether he's a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And again, they ask him what Jesus did. And this time, he mocks their questions and says, what, do y'all want to become disciples too? Later in this exchange, he turns the Pharisees' own beliefs back on them. He says, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Therein, he says, there's the answer to your question. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So Jesus goes from a miracle worker to a prophet to a man who was clearly from God. His third step toward insight. And when he joins the teachings of the Pharisees to his own experience of Jesus, he arrives at a conclusion that is diametrically opposed to that of the Pharisees. Jesus can be no sinner. He comes from God. And they have no reply to the man's words other than to accuse the man of being born in sin. And then they drive him away. What that means exactly, John does not say. It could be that they drove him out of their presence. But given the editorial comment when they interrogated his parents, it could also mean that he was driven out of the synagogue completely. Everyone the man encountered seemed blind to the truth. And then at this point, Jesus reappears in the story. And John tells us that he went looking for this man. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus continues to seek us out, never abandoning us, even when our neighbors, our family, and our religion do. In this encounter with the man, Jesus reveals himself to be the son of man, to which the man replies, Lord, I believe. Those words constitute one of the earliest, simplest, and most fundamental professions of the Christian faith. Lord, I believe. Now the man really sees who Jesus is. And he worships him. He recognizes Jesus as Lord. And then Jesus says, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see. And those who do see may become blind. So there it is. No one is beyond our saving. No one is beyond the reach of God's outstretched and gracious hands. Do we truly perceive that? Or are we blinded by our own sight? By our own fears? And by our own prejudices? To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. <clears throat> this time, let us affirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, if you have any joys or concerns you would like to share via Facebook or Messenger, uh, please do so. Uh, would uh, At this time, in, in let you know that uh, Bradley Von Tunglen has had his first infusion. We need to continue to keep him in our prayers. I need to continue to remember Mr. Collins and Laura Cosner. And I've been informed that Jimmy Mosley went home from rehab this past week and is getting around on a walker, continued prayers for her recovery. And Carol Brown's brother is going to uh, begin radiation treatments, so please remember him in your prayers as well. Okay. Who, who was that again? Okay, thank you. Let us pray. God of love, light in our darkness, life in the face of death, hope in the midst of fear. We give you thanks and praise that we may approach your throne of grace, lifting up our joys, our sorrows, and our concerns. We give you thanks that Carol's scan came back negative and pray that your healing hands continue to surround her and uphold her. In the days of uncertainty and fear, in the midst of the growing pandemic, we pray that you will be a source of peace that surpasses all understanding, that you will drown out all noise and help us hear and discern your truth that you will bless the women and men who are on the front lines of this pandemic, the doctors and nurses, and use them to be instruments of your healing. We pray for all who have been impacted by this pandemic because of the disease itself or because they've been laid off from work or face future layoffs. Holy God, you are always more willing to provide than we are to ask, but we humbly ask that you will provide all that we need in the days and weeks and months ahead. We pray your special blessings be upon Mr. Collins and Laura and Carol Brown's brother and upon Jimmy and Bradley. And for those who are known only to you, heal them in body, mind, or circumstance, working in them by your grace wonders beyond all they may dream or hope. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
we have heard and seen that God is good. Let us be about the business of bearing that good news into the world. Lighting the darkness, combating fear, and restoring hope. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.